I apologize for my voice. Um, maybe not enough tequila or too much talk, not sure. Uh, my name is Francisco Sanin. I'm the chair of the graduate program. And it's my pleasure tonight to welcome and introduce a good friend and welcome back to the school, in fact, uh, Teddy Cruz, who was here about three years ago uh, to lecture at the same time that uh, another friend of the school, Sergio Fajardo, was here. Uh, and that, I have to say, started a, a series of uh, snowball effects where Teddy is uh, doing some work with Medellin these days. But um, let me tell you a little bit about, for those of you who might be <clears throat> not as familiar with Teddy, uh, who I think in most architectural and artistic circles and intellectual would not need any introduction whatsoever, so it's more of an opportunity for me to talk to you than a need. Uh, he uh, is originally from Guatemala. His complete name is Teddy Edwin Cruz, which I'm very nice. To, I think that sounds very fantastic. Everybody very quickly goes to call him Teddy, which I think is wonderful. He started his uh, studies in Guatemala, uh, in studies of architecture, and then came to the States and received his B.Arc in California State Polytechnic, then went on to get a master's degree at Harvard. In between the two things, he was awarded the Rome Prize, and he spent two years in Rome uh, painting and having a good time and learning a very good Italian, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> he's a professor of public culture and urbanism at the visual art departments at the University of California, San Diego. I wish, I don't know, Dean Robbins, we need something like that. Professor of Public Culture and Urbanism, I think that's a, an amazing I title. Be, <laughs> I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> uh, I was tempted to uh, follow the, the path of um, listing his many accomplishments, publications, awards, exhibitions, but I realized that it would take the, the time of, a, of a, an entire lecture to list somebody who has literally covered the world with his work. His work is uh, incredibly influential at many different levels. Uh, I remember the first time I saw him, he doesn't know that, I was in 2008 at the Venice Biennale in the photo shoot section that was quite appropriate for GQ or uh, quite a, a wonderful, um, I, I thought it was a fashion statement or something, I didn't, then I learned there was Teddy Cruz. Little did I know that three years later we would be crossing the border between Mexico and the United States through a sewer, uh, something that uh, in all his wisdom Teddy had organized. And an incredible event that brought uh, people from all over the world, from Israel to uh, Europe, Latin America, to talk about what uh, this idea of his of the political equator. The political equator brings zones of tension and conflict from around the world together as a point of reflection on both architecture, politics, and the relation between both. And um, although he is well known for his exhibitions in MoMA, uh, in Rome, Istanbul, France, Spain, Latin America, Biennale after Biennale after Biennale, uh, he also understands that the, the, the activism of the architect goes away uh, um, outside of it and orchestrated this uh, event that was really a way, one of the many ways in which Teddy searches to visualize, to make visible and evident contradictions that exist within our physical environment that are clear manifestations of political tensions and conflicts. So uh, going across the sewer was a way to formalize or to make visual uh, ecological and political flows that go across the border between Mexico and the United States, uh, ecological territories that don't recognize political boundaries, and the political actions that take place across both of them. Uh, <clears throat> I had prepared a, a much longer list, and I realized I'm not going to have enough voice. But I wanted to make a couple of points. Uh, uh, Teddy is a very, um, he's a wordsmith. He will uh, tell us enormous amount of things, and I always have a hard time, but with great excitement, to follow all his constructions. But I wanted to call attention to a couple of things that I think stand to me out on his work. Uh, <clears throat> one, the way that he frames the relation between architecture and politics. And I'll try to make this very simple. Uh, Arch politics has entered the discourse of archi in architecture on several occasions in the last hundred years, 
And recently, very, very recently, it has sort of been, been legitimized uh, as a field of inquiry and as also as a condition of architecture for existence. However, I think it's important to distinguish, and I think that's what makes Terry's contribution really important, from those that um, see politics as simply uh, acknowledging that there is a power structure and that we need to connect to that power structure to make things happen. And that's one vision of politics that's incredibly mechanistic and, and, and limited, as opposed to one that conceptually understands that form is an actualization of politics, that the relation between form and politics is not one of simply uh, expediency of manifestation, but actually is the way to reconsider and reconceptualize form and its appearance. And I think when uh, Teddy's interest, as he says, in designing the conditions of design, the, the final project is a, a dialectical relationship with the political view, not simply a representation or a byproduct. Design becomes an active agent and is a political condition. I think that's an incredibly important uh, consideration in his work that I think in, in many uh, parts of our contemporary debate, we still drag this idea that architecture is replaced, a representation is a reflection, is the result, and politics, the way we involve it is expediency. Uh, he also, uh, obviously, in the same process, uh, problematizes the idea of the public uh, from being understood as a sort of homogeneous and singular to be multiple and conflictive, and precisely the role of the city and urbanism as a space where those conflicts get resolved. Uh, the second point, and I'll almost finish here, is that um, he's also shifted the attention of architectural discourse from the global to the margins, to the specific and to the small scale. And at the moment where most architectural criticism and debate and intellectual attention was given to the global, he reconceptualizes the margins both as a quantitative condition that in a world where more and more contradictions, both economic and political, are, are existing, the margin becomes bigger and bigger and more present and more active. But also qualitatively, in that the margin at the moment where um, economic policies, what we call neoliberalism, become more and more stifled, the real place of invention has shifted to the margin. The, particle, the cultural production in places like Latin America, Africa, uh, and Asia. And I think that, that acknowledging that then his work can go in incredibly easy from the very small scale of the community in San Isidro to the political equator, acknowledge that this cumulative effect of the margin has the potential to reframe and reconceptualize uh, the way that we understand both our professional and political praxis. And in that sense, I think his, uh, his work uh, both gives tools, borrows tools, and creates new frames for us to understand the possible, uh, let's say, scope in which architecture can participate in, uh, in the construction of the social body and of the built environment. I finally want to uh, acknowledge the group of faculty and the students who had worked really uh, hard on putting together the exhibition that's downstairs was the result of uh, an ongoing initiative in the grad program in which the students and faculty interact uh, in a very uh, intense manner with uh, somebody like Teddy in this case to put together an exhibition followed by an interview that took place last night and then follow up again by a, a lecture. And I think that um, in his own uh, terms, you know, the that this is multiple formats, multiple medias, and multiple protocols in which we can get to interact with his, prod with his work uh, is great. Uh, I want to thank Teddy for his generosity to the school and to the students in making this possible. So please help me welcome Teddy Cruz. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Francisco, thank you so much for that introduction. In fact, I mean, you were just at living or, you know, but if you wrote those concepts, I mean, those, those particular, that particular vantage point uh, regarding the work, I think I, I would appreciate a copy of it because I think that maybe we should go and have a cappuccino now because uh, I think that the main conceptual strands or desires, I think, behind the practice has been uh, pointed out uh, so well, so thank you for assembling that, that introduction. Um, also, I must say that, uh, you know, I, I met uh, uh, finally Fra Francisco when I came here 
uh, last time, and, and of course I had uh, met Mark uh, years before. I should say, Mark, you know, when you were actually a juror for the uh, Progressive Architecture Awards back in 2001, I think, <laughs> I mean, thank you so much, you know, because uh, that was one of the first moments of uh, really being in a, in a kind of national stage about, you know, some of the ideas that were uh, germinating from the Tijuana-San Diego border in the work. Um, so even though, of course, I, I, I knew Mark from before and then coming here through uh, Francisco uh, and knowing Mark being one of the most amazing, I, I would say, cultural pimps in the United <laughs> States, uh, uh, I, that's, that, that, that's my aspiration, actually, to be that. Uh, uh, I think when I came here in Francisco, I met Sergio Fajardo and after that, uh, I established a kind of relationship with Sergio uh, that culminated with Francisco and Sergio Fajardo coming to the border to this event later going to Medellin and now working, uh, we in fact, with Sergio and others and Francisco in visualizing, creating this project of visualization of the political uh, and the processes that have taken place there. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say is that that day when I came here a few years ago was really a, a juncture and as usual, these moments are enabling of other moments. And I think that that's what a conversation is all about. And I think this project of uh, students assembling a practice, opening it up, uh, you know, producing connections of the, of the kind is really a fantastic pedagogical tool. So thank you to the students and to the organizers uh, uh, as well. Uh, the group of students who really produce this have been incredibly sweet and, and incredibly challenging, I think. Uh, so thank you. I should d dive right into the images because I uh, have a few stories to tell you. And I think it is an augment uh, augmenting what I maybe shared last time, but probably many of you were not here. So I think it's dedicated to uh, to, to the students primarily who are not familiar uh, uh, with the work. Uh, let me, uh, for a moment, and I'm, I don't know why, uh, I'm trying to really keep uh, uh, the time uh, here. Um, hold on a moment. It's not working. Um, I'm trying to keep uh, the, this, the, 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 the lap, lap, stop, reset. Okay, now, there, good. Uh, okay. <laughs> So uh, I, I would like to begin, I, I, you know, usually I, I'm, I've been meditating about this and it's very difficult, as I was mentioning yesterday in the interview, and I hope not to say that too many times, what I said yesterday in the interview, because I will, I've been meditating about the fact that any conversation in, in our time, primarily in our own milieu as architects, as artists, cannot begin without really reflecting uh, uh, on the very moment we occupy. I mean, of course, it's... Uh, obvious that we uh, occupy an amazing juncture in history, unprecedented crisis uh, across any imaginable, imaginable register. And I uh, need to reflect uh, as a point of departure about what is the nature of that crisis. Uh, so recently I found these two lines in the New York Times in a, an amazing graph, in a, an amazing statistical graph that usually are so hermetic, very difficult to access. But when I saw these two lines, I, I, they served me uh, to really, again, clarify uh, where we are at this moment. You know, probably already is familiar to many of you uh, the fact that any politician might begin a discourse by saying, we, we are ex experiencing the worst recession since the Great Depression. You know, and even though I lived the first 20 years of my life outside the United States, I really wanted to find out more what do you mean by that. Uh, obviously, the graph, which is really about these two lines, was extremely clear. Uh, and I began to realize, of course, the very simple and very obvious relationships between the moment now, the crisis today, and what happened in the Great Depression. Uh, but nevertheless, I wanted to play with this uh, uh, obvious uh, statement. I'm saying this also, by the way, because it seems to me that the obvious continues to stare us on the face, but we nevertheless seem paralyzed, uh, not uh, able to advance any procedures to transcend it, uh, to transcend this uh, uh, conflict or this crisis. Uh, so the graph really told me that definitely the simil sim similarities between those two moments is, is very clear. At those two junctures, at those two moments in recent history, unprecedented inequality, uh, the income gap, uh, exorbitant in, in a sense, but also supported by the lowest marginal tax rates uh, on the wealthy at those very instances. So largest income gap, lowest marginal taxes, and so on. So yes, it was clear that those two moments are similar, but very seldom I began to meditate. We talk about what happened after each of those moments. And this is what, how I wanted to begin. 
um, I began to realize, and again, this is extremely impressionistic, okay? I, I work with, uh, how would I call it, it's hopefully accurate approximations. I'm very impressionistic in my thinking and not necessarily it's that analytical. I began to realize that at that moment in the Great Depression, the economic power was equally concentrated in the very few, let's say, in the upper echelons of this society. But at the same time, you can argue that the politi political power was still very open in seeking a kind of reformation of the institutions. First of all, the banking industry was not bailed out, so it prompted a kind of urgent uh, reformation of institutional uh, protocols. But also, the, there was the political will somehow, after that uh, uh, Great Depression, to seek a kind of public imagination to restore some kind of reliance or, re or resiliency or uh, collaborative efforts across institutions uh, to prompt what uh, developed into the New Deal, uh, of course. Uh, the WPA program, public spending was not a forbidden word in our political language. Uh, the Works Progress Administration, the, the, the kind of uh, dissemination of uh, work strategies across communities. By 1944, FDR had presented his second Bill of Rights. Have you? The students primarily. Have you read that document recently? Uh, I would uh, urge you to, to seek, seek it. Uh, unbelievable uh, guidelines about uh, how to really uh, um, rethink, again, uh, the possibility of a civic imagination and so on. Uh, of course, that middle, uh, that middle sec section of the graph uh, suggests a very different agenda. Uh, in unprecedented investment in public infrastructure, uh, public education, uh, public housing, the park systems. Uh, this is a, a very different, uh, of course, landscape uh, to the one that we find today. Of course, we all know that by 1982, uh, uh, things begin to change. The kind of uh, privatization of public resources, uh, the impact of free uh, market economics and policies begins to completely change the terms. I, I don't want to dwell, of course, on the nature of that. That's already obvious. Just wanted to dwell on the recognition that maybe between 1945 <coughs> to 1982 in this country, there was a seemingly more equitative distribution of resources. Let's say for a moment that the 1% was more like 35% and the 99% was more like 65% and so on. Of course, we all know that by 2006, out of those very neoliberal politics and economics of development, unprecedented growth, uh, benefiting individuals and their promise for economic expansion at the expense of the collective, this economy inflates, uh, concentrated once more the economic power into, let's say in this case, 10% of the population of this country owning 50% of the income and the resources, 1% owning 24% of income and resources. By 2008, in the middle of the Venice Biennial, uh, the, the economy collapses uh, and, of course, reveals once more the false, falsehood, as I call it, of this strange notion, the kind of branding of the American dream in the context of trickle-down economics that, for me, is still odd. You know, this, I, I, at, times, I, at times, I think that only in the, in the United States, the poor defend the rich hoping that at some point that wealth will touch all of us and we will become <laughs> equally as wealthy. So this uh, finally reveals the kind of hypocrisy of this type of uh, uh, idea in the context of assuring democracy as the almighty right to be left alone. Uh, of course, uh, at the same time, I begin to meditate uh, what in fact is very different to after the Great Depression. And I called it in this uh, small essay, the three slaps on the face of the American public. First, the 99%, let's call it the American public, comes to the rescue of uh, the very architects of the crisis uh, in the shape of the Wall Street bailouts, we all know, first slap. <laughs> Second, uh, of course, one would imagine, okay, fine, we save you guys, uh, you might as well uh, help us to produce some levels of assurances, guarantees to protect the American homeowner. But in the absence of such a uh, self-assured kind of, uh, how would I call it, a political will that would enable those guarantees, millions of foreclosures occur in this country, also prompting unprecedented unemployment, second slap on the face of the American public, and still unable to really produce a kind of position that would enable the reformation of these institutions. 
uh, a very small faction in this country begins to capture the public's opinion uh, uh, to really begin to prompt an unprecedented discourse that really begins to enable the assurance once more of unprecedented public spending cuts. The third slap finally on the American public and what I would call the shrinking relevancy of the public in this country. I'm thinking that uh, while this is happening, the 1% generally speaking, remains untouched, unaccountable, solidifying ultimately a kind of culture of, of unaccountability and impunity, if I can call it that. But at the same time, it suggests that not only the, 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 the economic power has been concentrated in such a way, but what is different in our time is that the political power is equally concentrated uh, a, a, as well, prompting out of uh, how would I call it, this uh, uh, machine of philanthropy that has, in fact, a enabled a lobbying culture in Washington, D.C. that we all know that buys votes, public opinion, and so on. Where is our collective imagination? Where is the public in this context? So what I am arguing is that while we uh, continue to amplify this crisis as being economic, yes, it is, as being environmental, yes, it is, I would argue primarily it is a cultural crisis, a crisis of the institutions, unable to rethink themselves in the protocols embedded in these transactions. I think that at this moment we need to amplify, this is you know, Harry Cobb, uh, in fact a friend of mine, older architect uh, uh, in a conversation, he told me another, when I was telling him about this uh, uh, small essay, he said another difference, he said, is, you know, I remember I was eight years old when the Great Depression happened, he said, and I still remember my father coming after he, uh, home after he lost his job, and uh, he still remembers Harry, uh, his uh, parents, uh, classmates selling apples on the street, he said, I mean, something that is different at our time, in our time, is that it hasn't touched us viscerally. The kind of uh, unprecedented inequality hasn't really touched our everyday lives, all of us. So I think, uh, nevertheless, we need to amplify that it, it is unprecedented inequality that is at stake at this moment. And I want to begin again by suggesting that a society that is anti-government ultimately hurts the city in our field, ultimately of architecture and urbanism, that a society that is anti-taxes hurts the city, that a society that is anti-public hurts the city, that a society that is anti-immigration hurts the city, and I think that at this context uh, we can argue that the crisis is nothing new. I recently was uh, walking through the uh, neighborhoods in East Baltimore, seeing blocks after blocks of dilapidated housing, uh, the defunding of public services, public infrastructure, education has been part of our context for many decades already, uh, all the way to the neighborhoods of North Philadelphia, where blocks after blocks of empty houses and buildings and depressed communities to the demolitions in Cleveland uh, by banks or foreclose new homes so that it's easier to demolish than to manage these environments differently. While we tend to think that design only serves good causes, this catastrophe has been designed. And I'm interested in the possibility uh, that our institutions begin to enact what could be called uh, a kind of forensics uh, of the crisis. Who produced the crisis in the first place? What type of institutional protocols enabled it? So can we retroactively begin to uh, piece together uh, what, again, the conditions that produce that crisis? That's the material, I think, and I would argue for the contemporary designer, the very conditions that produce the crisis. Uh, and probably these people are not designers, Dan and Terry, who decided to produce this diagram, a kind of reverse engineering of their mortgage. They wanted to find out who owned their mortgage, and I just uh, put one page here, the document has three or four pages. So obviously, it is not the catastrophe itself as uh, represented in terms of the ruins uh, of uh, that disinvestment, but also the kind of picturesque sprawl uh, spells catastrophe. And I think that ultimately that's something that I have been um, reflecting recently, that we all know that the problem has been uh, 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 the way we have been growing. But sometimes I worry that uh, 
the problem, in fact, while that is the recognition of that is essential, uh, the problem is the way we think we are solving the problem. Uh, that the way that we have been growing has become ultimately unsustainable. And the icons, the figures, the symbols of this growth continue to permeate. I mean, not anymore this, because now this has been sold to China, obviously, uh, because they are important, our worst examples. Uh, but nevertheless, the way we solve the problem is ultimately the problem. Uh, and in, in terms of the kind of strange way of camouflaging the very politics, the very politics. <laughs> uh, is this microphone working? Uh, the very politics and economics that have enabled that growth. That is, in fact, the site of intervention, the challenging of those very policies and economics. Can those be the new field of intervention? The rethinking of policy, of course, obviously, but the performance themselves uh, of, uh, that have enabled this uh, urbanization and steroids. How do we reorganize as institutions, as architects, uh, as activists in the context of these uh, uh, transformations? I would argue we need to take detours, and I think that has been a primary uh, condition in my own practice, uh, to begin to contact the domains that have remained peripheral to design, namely economics, of course, political envelopes, uh, social organizational models, partnerships and collaborations with other types of agencies and so on, hopefully only to return to architecture armed with different procedures, with the procedures of the other. Expanded modes of practice. Not all of us want to design buildings. Maybe we want to be engaging in the designing uh, of systems of organizational uh, logics across uh, political and economic processes. So in that context, one of the most inspirational statements, which I think I might have shared last time I was here, uh, was the statement, uh, it did not come from an architect or a philosopher or a writer, but in fact, a, a, a statement uh, of General Petraeus when he came back after his first tour of Iraq uh, and he presented to Congress. It was again an article in the New York Times. I, sh I wish I could have saved it. If somebody finds it, please let me know. Because I followed uh, uh, literally the statement he presented to Congress that the contemporary soldier needed to transform that the contemporary soldier could not be anymore this sort of robot-like figure that controls the war at a distance, but the contemporary soldier had to transform into a social worker, an anthropologist, and versed in many languages, he said. And that also the war was not really fought at a distance, but out of the immediacy uh, of social uh, relations, familial dynamics on the streets in the neighborhoods of Iraq and so on. So in other words, conveying in my mind, as I was translating this, uh, that uh, notions of the avant-garde that have sold a critical project based on critical distance from the institutions needed to transform in our time, obviously, in a project that was about critical proximity to the institutions, uh, to transform them, of course, from within. But also the fact that uh, maybe he was not suggesting that we should become social workers as architects. There is something that we, of course, advance out of our, our own disciplinarity. But nevertheless, we could, for a moment, borrow the procedures from the other in order to begin challenging our own protocols. And I'm, I'm interested in that notion of uh, the kind of contamination of one field into another, not through images, but through procedures. And obviously, this was beginning to tell me that, of course, the right-wing uh, factions of this country was beginning to borrow or, in fact, steal the most compelling concepts coming from the left. And I'm saying this because recently I've been in a debate with a few friends of mine suggesting that in fact, we let them steal our ideas not on a, very, a few years ago. In other words, all the rhetoric coming from philosophy, coming from the type of uh, emancipatory texts of uh, theory in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and so on, resiliency, decentralization, self-organization, and logics, multiplicity, hybridity, ultimately, that became more operational, became instrumentalized by digitalized capitalism while for us in academia remain ensconced as just metaphorical tropes or embedded in academic debates. I think that we let them steal those concepts because they became operational uh, in one way and, f and now we weep. This is what I'm uh, arguing, that we need to recuperate those very concepts. I'm saying this because I was part of a blog very quickly when I, I mentioned something about uh, some kind of negotiation with this and that and said, oh, be careful because you are beginning to sound too much like a corporate or whatever, or this and that, and said, 
who cares? You know, I want to really steal the instruments, steal the knowledge, or retake the knowledge of the other to really bring back uh, a other mode of operation uh, to our own camp. So yes, uh, this uh, signifies that it is in fact conflict, geographies of conflict, crisis itself as a site of investigation. And for my work, it's been a very specific geography of conflict that I've been interested in exposing and visualizing as a laboratory for rethinking my own role as designer, as an architect uh, uh, located here. And many of you know already this area. This is Tijuana, San Diego, and this uh, figure ground drawing where I reverse the terms uh, the white is buildings, the black is the leftover space, just to dramatize how Tijuana crashes against the border. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the river that comes from the Colorado River transforms into the Alamar, enters into Mexico, exits back into the United States uh, through the last bit of it, which is the estuary, the Tijuana River estuary. This will be characters uh, in the rest of the images I will show you. Uh, I, cu I cr cut a cross section. Uh, across these two cities, even though most of my work has been emblematically using the border wall. Uh, but I'm more interested in the transborder flows that make that border not only expose it as a kind of artifact that demarcates and divides the territory, but also to suggest, of, of course, that the border is porous and elastic. Uh, and I began uh, simply by uh, narrativizing that section, that photographic section that I ended up calling a 60 linear miles of transborder conflict beginning 30 miles deep into San Diego and 30 miles deep into Tijuana. The radicalization of the local, I called it. And in that case, because the radical has been now uh, somehow exhausted to death, by radical I mean getting to the root. Getting to the root of the issues that really have produced such collisions. So the radicalizing and the exposure, the visualization of the specificity of the political as embedded in this territory. Beginning 30 miles deep into San Diego, uh, I began to document visually, photographically, very simply, a series of environments where ecologies collide, where we find the conflict between top-down forces of urbanization uh, and maybe social and natural networks. So 30 miles deep into San Diego, we find the conflict between top-down development and the topography, as many of these amazing canyons in the edges of the city have begun to be flattened by developers to install the cheap recipes of suburbanization in the shape of master plan gated communities, maybe a little bit below. We find now the conflict between large infrastructure and the watershed as the freeway ecology, huge infrastructure in Southern California, descends across the coastal cities colliding with many of these uh, rivers and creeks, this natural hydrology, the conflict between gated communities and everyday life, or as Rebecca Solnet called it, the apartheid of uh, social life, the conflict between military bases and environmental zones, the only places where an otherwise continuous urbanization from Los Angeles to Tijuana is interrupted is where we find these military bases. This is strange, again, alliance of systems of development, militarization, and environmentalism. The conflict between formal and informal urbanizations, economies, and densities, as neighborhoods in San Diego are retrofitted by immigrants. The conflict between two cities, two border cities that repel, that ignore each other, in fact, in, in constructing a reciprocal a future. As we enter into Tijuana, you can see the river colliding with the wall. Uh, the conflict between, of course, the river and the actual uh, border. The conflict now in Tijuana between informal settlements, slums, and the watershed systems. The conflict between housing, factories, in the edges of Tijuana. The conflict between density and sprawl, as also developers in Tijuana are imitating uh, the, the, the recipes of suburbanization of their counterparts in San Diego, but in miniature. Uh, the conflict now, as we arrive to the other end of this uh, section, which I usually call the mama of all con of conflicts here, the conflict between the natural and the political at the very side where the border wall sinks into the Pacific Ocean. And this is the image that I amplified in a 90 foot long uh, scream that was installed at the U.S. Pavilion in 2008, the very month that the economy collapsed, juxtaposed by a horizon of local conflicts, suggesting that it was in the midst, in the midst of each of those collisions where architectural practice needed to reposition itself in rethinking its own protocols. Of course, at the book ends of this section, 
is probably the most emblematic of conflicts. Uh, no other place in the world you would find some of the wealthiest real estate as found in the edges of San Diego, 20 minutes away from some of the poorest settlements in Latin America. I'm suggesting about the radical proximity of enclaves of wealth and power surrounded by circles of scarcity and poverty. So it is a piece that, uh, again, uh, was such a treat to install it, you know, the very month or the very, uh, uh, you know, just before the Bush administration packed its bags, uh, uh, having the opportunity to, in fact, uh, re rethink the facade of the American pavilion with the border wall. Um, and of course, framing the discussion in that sense. I'm interested, as I mentioned yesterday, in the reorganization of that discussion. Can conflict be, in fact, a creative tool uh, in visualizing uh, these conditions? Of course, uh, these images are real because when globalization hits the ground, it transforms into these artifacts such as this uh, border wall that transforms San Diego into the world's largest gated community. It's obvious that in the construction of the border, which continues to harden in our time, we, continues, uh, we continue to witness the hardening of social and public legislature and the construction of the city and the installment of these logics of development that really that have atomized our cities into this enclave, of course, of isolated islands, an urbanism of separation, of division, uh, and so on. I'm interested in the very uh, transborder uh, invisible dynamics that transcend uh, this formidable barrier uh, across San Diego, Tijuana in the shape of north-south, south-north flows. Uh, and or as a friend of mine uh, from Tijuana once told me, the wall exists only to be transgressed, he said. And in that sense, the most emblematic image of our aspirations, I think, as architects or artists the transgression of our own fears, our own conventions and preconceptions. For me, these metaphors are operative. They are not just simple images. Uh, there is a political dimension to these images. And so I've been interested in, on one direction, the flow of people, and in the other, the flow of waste. This is something that has been very characteristic and emblematic of my research, uh, beginning to measure or visualize uh, the, in fact, the importation of waste from uh, San Diego into Tijuana, as uh, San Diego, as, as Tijuana builds itself with the urban debris of San Diego, with the waste, with the leftovers of San Diego, such as these post-war uh, bungalows, these small bungalows that in the last decades, as uh, developers have begun to produce a more inflated version uh, of uh, those levy towns, uh, uh, these small houses here are waiting to cross the border. So not only people cross the border, but entire pieces of one city move to the other. And when these houses are uh, put in the Tijuana landscape, they are elevated on top of these steel frames, leaving the first floor to become the second, to be injected with other narratives, other uses. I call this a kind of club sandwich urbanization, this fearless approximation of opposites. This one is a wonderful, I have stories for all of them uh, in terms of some documents, some videos that I began to produce. This one is this uh, person who wanted uh, the most emblematic pink track home of San Diego while maintaining his car repair shop beneath. So this, again, a strange uh, uh, kind of proximity of opposites. Uh, at the same time, not only houses, but small pieces. You all know about how tires, uh, discarded rubber tires, are used for constructing retaining walls. But in this context, I always uh, you know, look at these images as really fantastical kind of uh, uh, possibilities of how people in socioeconomic emergency have begun to figure out how to peel off these tires, how to interlock them, loop them to produce a more efficient retaining wall. Everything that we have, might have learned from contemporary urban theory, how uh, from the one to the many, from the unit to the system, uh, is really very much alive here. I want to say I'm not glorifying poverty here. I will actually explain myself a little better later. But nevertheless, as an architect who understands the world through images, I cannot deny the power of these amazing images in suggesting that embedded in these places of scarcity, there is a creative intelligence from which we can harvest procedures and, in fact, uh, uh, ways of acting. Uh, the garage doors that are imported from San Diego, from many of those older subdivisions, uh, 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 imported uh, into, Tij uh, into Tijuana en masse to produce social housing in many of those environments. Imagine the garage doors of Riverside producing 
the entire skin for many of these new constructions in these shanty towns. So again, unavoidably, this sort of layering and this sort of bricolage is uh, incredibly powerful. But behind these images, there is a process. And in fact, that process for me has been compelling to witness. Imagine that in the last years, levy, the levy towns of Southern California have begun to dismantle. Uh, and their debris uh, moves 20 minutes south to construct the new periphery of Tijuana. We can argue that levy towns, the Southern California levy towns, have been recycled into Tijuana's informal settlements. I'm interested in the operative dimension of these processes, the operative dimension of informality, primarily at a time when we are seduced once more by these interesting processes that uh, layer these environments with a level of social, economic, and political complexity. Uh, we need to remind ourselves that the informal is not just an image. Uh, but in fact, the informal is a praxis. And this is a particularly one of the main concepts that have been instrumental in my, in my own work, is to suggest that the informal is in fact an act of reorganizing uh, imposed political boundaries and economic recipes. And I think that embedded in the informal, there is a set of procedures that need to really be uh, um, forwarded or translated, in fact, interpreted and so on. Some of those procedures have been essential to understand here. One of them is that behind these images uh, of recycling, there is in fact uh, not only an aesthetic value nevertheless, uh, but primarily there is a, a political economy of waste that in fact these systems are sold and, and, and distributed uh, out of a particular uh, social organizational logic. So it's part of an economy that is important to the sustainability of some of these environments. Uh, another one is really uh, how uh, dramatic it is to understand that through these transactions with boundaries and with resources, uh, the informal here begins to challenge our very notions of property. So this rethinking of property and natural boundaries in many of these canyons where these slums are positioned is really fundamental. What I'm trying to say is that in these canyons, uh, the land title agencies that uh, arbitrarily demarcate the boundaries between communities, which is what we do in the city, the arbitrary borders uh, delineated by administrative boundaries, etc., ignoring social and ecological uh, boundaries, uh, are in, in a conflict with, in fact, those natural uh, systems. So one uh, issue has been in these communities where I've been working in, co in collaboration with activists is to forward a very different model of political representation. Can, in fact, a micro-basin be a way of defining or constructing a neighborhood? Uh, and in so doing as well, the representation of a community to, in fact, uh, a, enable the governance of that particular enclave. Uh, so this relationship of uh, uh, natural uh, systems, property, and new models of political representation at the scale of the local is one kind of equation that has been an interesting one, a kind of triangulation. Uh, conflict, of course, uh, many of our projects begin by uh, understanding uh, the nature of this conflict. Simply that, who are the actors? Right? Who are the institutions? And, the conditions that are behind this conflict. So one primary conflict in, a, in this work has been, in Tijuana at least, a conflict between factories, labor, and housing. Uh, because it's interesting to notice that many of these maquiladoras or factories that, you know, Tijuana is a city of factories. It's the capital of television, where, as, of assembly of televisions in the world. Uh, one of those uh, places where, uh, by detaxing these companies, you know, they can really take advantage of cheap labor without any accountability. They place themselves in the middle of the slums, borrowing labor cheaply, uh, uh, it, it, without, again, returning any kind of uh, possibility. So the rethinking of the size of engagement I'm saying this because when we began to enter the topic of the informal and the informal settlements, instead of rushing to the settlement as architects with our kit of parts to pound nails out of the sign build studios, you know, uh, thinking that we're going to solve the problem, we wanted to instead go to the source of the problem, which is in fact the factory. So this again detour uh, and rethinking the site of engagement. Because in fact we noticed that that was the relationship. Uh, they, borrowing labor, 
at, in places where, in fact, those canyons can be argued as factories for housing because people build their own uh, 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 conditions of dwelling. So we enter the factory, which in this case uh, was a Spanish maquiladora that produces these uh, lightweight um, pallet racks that are exported all over the world. And we negotiated with them a very simple kind of agreement. I'm interested in the designing of these agreements. Uh, while the factory borrows labor, can the factory give something in return with its own material systems uh, and production? Can the modes of production be displaced to the community and out of sweat equity and this uh, collaboration across government, the factory and the activists, we could maybe generate a model that can insert ourselves as designers into the factory, altering their own systems uh, into new types of uh, micro infrastructures. So the factory became the site of intervention uh, in producing what we've been developing, an architecture of parts. This one is a very, probably the most exciting one out of very simple lightweight, uh, uh, light gauge metal, the uh, production of these uh, space frames that do not need welding uh, and that can be uh, easily assembled into uh, a la a long span uh, conditions that can retrofit existing environments with uh, different possibilities. So this is something that uh, we've been developing and recently uh, getting ready for certain application which is essential to really show how this can perform or inspired by, of course, somebody like Jean Prouvé, uh, the kind of uh, beam that is a spine that can uh, uh, be part of this, again, existing environments but not only structural as well, uh, in this case, as a kind of collector of water. So it's a kind of, uh, how would I call it? A, a, uh, a, a water collection, uh, like a gutter beam. We call it the gutter beam, yes, and in, in, in collecting water. So these uh, small pieces, this one is the, the most obvious one because it was using the actual pallet racks uh, as, in fact, the threading mechanisms for some of these uh, environments. So the linking of material resources and sweat equity, which is very much alive in these canyons, began to open up these possibilities. So we produced a few of these uh, that we uh, uh, are testing in creating similarly to those uh, rubber tires uh, that thread uh, the waste into other systems of scaffolding that can in fact uh, uh, produce a, a more uh, sustainable but also more legible system uh, of mediation across that waste across a public but across also private uh, types of environments. A kind of, uh, how would I call it, a, a, a portable new Babylon of sorts, okay? This sort of transformative uh, uh, systems. Now, uh, just for a moment, you know, I think I have, might have mentioned this to the students before, but I remember at some point giving a presentation about these systems and somebody from the audience, you know, asked me, you know, who are you to say that these people want to be surrounded by trash? Uh, if you were to ask them, uh, they would tell you that they would like to, in fact, live in a Mac mansion in San Diego. And in fact, I've asked that question and in fact, that has been the answer. Uh, but what I answered this person at the time, I said, uh, you tell me when are these people going to be able uh, to live there? In the next two years, in the next five, or in the next 60 years? In other words, what came to me was a very simple statement. What do we do in the meantime? And I began to rethink the very nature of infrastructure at that moment uh, that really would mediate uh, the small and the large, the kind of temporal and socioeconomic contingencies that really make these environments. Transitional infrastructures, rethinking the very meaning of infrastructure through, in fact, social organization. Uh, that relationship, again, that can be problematized between the social and the formal. I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen this video. Um, but every time I see it, I am still surprised because uh, this is sort of the aspiration, uh, maybe or not, uh, uh, in the redefining of infrastructure. Can in fact, uh, human contingency, how would I call it, uh, socio-economic contingency, begin to enable a very different conceptualization, uh, begin to enable a different conceptualization of what infrastructure is. Can in fact these spaces be agile enough to accept transformation, uh, adaptability, the kind of flexibility that we continue to aspire and so on. So the nature, again, the notion that socioeconomic contingency has been absent from our aspiration, aspirations of an architecture that morphs, that moves, 
uh, that transforms and so on, because as architects we just freeze that possibility into self-referential, uh, whether algorithmic, based, uh, more, more for genetics, you call it, whatever, but the social dimension is always, I think, or the economic absent from those incredible constructs. If parametrics could do to politics and economics what it does to skins and form, then we are talking because in fact we will be able to be more comprehensive in the relationship of most of production, uh, formal devices, and social organizational logics. Uh, of course, uh, waste goes uh, south, but primarily the flow that really intrigues me a lot and has been at the center uh, of my investigation has been the impact of people, immigrants, in the transformation of the American neighborhood. And I've been as an artist trying to document uh, this uh, phenomena across uh, videos and na narratives that have been very emblematic uh, of these conditions. This one called the non-conforming Buddha, which in fact I should say, you know, I've been interested in how to make drawings that are extremely simple. Uh, I know that in our schools of architecture we've been seduced with complexity for complexity's sake and even though it's essential to engage the kind of diagram diagramming of the multiplicity of forces that really are at play in organization, many of our drawings remain drawings for other architects. I've been interested in drawings that can have be accessible by community activists and politicians, such as this one. It was a transborder land use uh, drawing. Imagine a demostraphic border in the world, not one single transborder land use map exists. So I had to, in a lyrical way, construct it to the north, the big chunks of color. Uh, of land use in Southern California, separating large bedroom communities from retail centers and so on. To the south, the high, high pixelation uh, of uh, three-dimensional zoning of Tijuana, uh, in, 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 which of course depends on certain uh, levels of illegality and so on. I began to argue that this confetti of alternative uses had begun to infiltrate itself into the large. The kind of uh, idea that the future of Southern California depends on the pixelation of the large with the small. And when this confetti hits the ground, it's really about the alteration of small parcels in many marginal uh, neighborhoods, in fact, in the mid city of uh, San Diego. And it is this uh, impact, again, of this contingency uh, of uh, socioeconomic uh, conditions, a garage that is activated by an illegal economy or a granny flat that is built illegally behind an official house, what begins to construct ultimately uh, an interesting a transformation, let's say, of what a parcel might be. So these illegal alterations, and one that is very emblematic in my work is the story of the illegal Buddha, uh, or the informal Buddha, uh, which is in fact a little post-war house that saved itself. It did not go in exile into Tijuana, but was retrofitted by this Buddhist temple in the last 25 years. Uh, and in so doing, of course, the house has transformed typologically. I'm interested in that physical transformation, transforming the parcel into a small socioeconomic system. Uh, and it, but I, I am interested in how this Buddhist temple, which is in the middle of this neighborhood, begins to be an agency that, in fact, out of its own programming, social, economic, pedagogical, cultural, begins to harvest, begins to translate, begins to convene the informal in this neighborhood. I'm interested, through these stories, to rethink the very nature of density, which we have perpetuated institutionally as an abstract equation. Density is really this, an amount of things per acre, isn't it? I mean, across the board. I think that one first thing we need to do in rethinking these institutional protocols is to challenge the abstraction of these recipes, enabling levels of specificity. Can, in fact, density be measured as an amount of social exchanges per acre, as that Buddhist temple enables a series of transactions that are invisible, of course, from the planning and governmental agencies. So yes, density, again, as a device to rethink the relationship across socioeconomic invisible uh, contingencies. So the border, the marginal border, in this case, a neighborhood, as a site of production. I've been uh, reflecting about this, and I think that as uh, the architecture intelligentsia in the last years of glamorous economy flocked in mass to Dubai and China you know, to build their dream castles, camouflaging, in fact, uh, those political and economic uh, 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 recipes that perpetuated the crisis in the first place. Uh, catapulting, in fact, the global city as the epicenter of consumption. In other words, urbanizations 
characterized by consumption and display architecture becoming a device, uh, I would argue that it is in marginal communities, sectors of scarcity, uh, where production became, remained sites of production, cultural, social production, uh, and that's what has been of interest to me. We all know that uh, out of uh, tax increment based uh, type of financing, many downtowns became bubbles of wealth. Uh, we all know that the suburbs became, you know, it used to be that the suburbs was, a, was the alternative to affordability, but in the last years became equally monsters of growth as necessitating huge infrastructural investment. Uh, began to realize that the margins now were internal to the city in many of these, these, these uh, depressed uh, mid-city neighborhoods, where in fact many of these diasporas from Latin America, Asia, and Africa were settling in the last years, transforming again those levy towns into uh, 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 these altered environments. Uh, also, it has been essential to rethink not only density, mixed use, many of the issues that have been perpetuated as cliches in our system, but it has been essential to rethink the very nature of citizenship. You know, I live next to Arizona, okay, where it has become the epicenter of anti-immigration policy. I've been trying to suggest that these processes of alteration, adaptation, uh, embedded in these uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, out of immigrants, uh, uh, actions and organization, uh, social organization, can forward them. Those, those, acts, those actions of alteration can be the devices, the kind of DNA to transform policy. That's primarily the desire of my practice. Can the invisibility of those transactions serve as devices, mediated and translated by uh, some of us into new models of policy and economy. That citizenship it, it must be conceived less as a kind of having the papers that make you belong to a private club, but in fact citizenship is a creative act that reorganizes not only the spaces of the city, but also institutional protocols. So yes, once more, the kind of social contingency uh, embedded in the very no uh, nature of the civic uh, or of civil society uh, is at stake here. Uh, an urbanization beyond the property line uh, has been the motto, uh, somehow, our practice. Uh, in so doing, uh, we need to re-engage or engage uh, the other, again, domains, as I was mentioning before, that have been peripheral to our discussion in the schools of architecture. Can we, in fact, be the designers of alternative performance? Uh, can, in fact, the abstraction, once more, of these models uh, of development be injected with the ambiguity of informal economies uh, so that uh, the two ladies who uh, rent a three-bedroom uh, 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 house uh, transforming it into an illegal uh, nursery uh, absorbed by a non-profit organization and represented by them in these neighborhoods be part of that uh, construction of that performa can the sweat equity as a, a teenager uh, who, who is uh, volunteering to teach dancing in Hudson, New York uh, uh, be uh, giving something in return in terms of an exchange of social service for a rent and equally absorbed by these processes. There is one that I'm working on very specifically right now that they, there is no time to tell you because I'm trying to rush through, through these uh, examples, but uh, of bundling. It's about bundling, the kind of creative uh, entrepreneurial agency of people who are invisible, but they need representation uh, in, the, in a variety of sectors. Uh, uh, three activists in a neighborhood who cook, two uh, activists who actually are trying to produce a theater company uh, and need a black box theater, a professor in the university who wants to in fact invest in, 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 in enabling a very different idea of housing. How do we bring together these micro communities and through that construct our own performa that eventually would have special consequences, ultimately aesthetic consequences. So it is this construction of a performa out of the recognition. In fact, we need to have the knowledge of developers uh, because developers know exactly how to manipulate time and resources without investing that much. And it is a transference of that knowledge into our own ways of conceptualizing a space where we could begin to maybe connect the dots. The rethinking of ownership, primary in our time, of property. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the, probably the most, if I can say, the most, uh, how would I call it, provocative, if I can call it that, uh, statements in terms of what my research has been. One, I already mentioned it, can a micro basin be a way of constructing community or, or defining a neighborhood. But the other one is, can an economic performer be an instrument to construct community? Um, and of course, it is that negotiation of uh, the translation of invisible 
um, informal, uh, a, 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 the kind of creative intelligence of entrepreneurship into new models of development. This is uh, that what inspires some of the typologies that we were working in Hudson, New York a while back uh, that brought together a variety of non-profit organizations, the, the reclamation of leftover spaces in the city, the kind of bringing to, together of different constituencies into a system uh, that threaded vacant uh, abandoned lots into a series of, again, infrastructural devices that then began to be the basis for a variety of small-scale development uh, uh, that um, unfortunately uh, became, uh, came to a stop in 2008. But it was emblematic of uh, how to inject, again, this, uh, or design these systems of collaboration. So in essence, this probably has been one emblematic image from the uh, confetti uh, piece uh, to the understanding of the Buddhist temple as a micro socioeconomic system to the idea that architects can be facilitators uh, of uh, uh, new types of collaborations, but also the designers of economic and political process, uh, ultimately how the political and the economic would have special consequences. I think that that uh, began to uh, bring a project together that was addressing, in my mind, one of the most fundamental uh, uh, gaps, which is the, gaps, the gap that has separated, of course, institutions and publics. So this idea that also as architects, we could design collaboration. I mean, we think that we can go with our tools to a community, again, to solve the problem, but we never think of the need to partner with others. That it is, in fact, uh, the activists working in these neighborhoods, the nonprofit organizations that are really grounded as community-based practices in these neighborhoods, who have the political and uh, the, uh, the social knowledge. Uh, and in that sense, um, that has been uh, for us, uh, for me at least in the last 10 years in the neighborhood of San Isidro, an amazing asset. The partnership of a, with a nonprofit organization called Casa Familiar, and through time, through the last 10 years, construct a process together. I love the, I was recently in Medellin and, and an artist, a social activist, told me the most beautiful definition of a curator is that person who accompanies process uh, and that uh, exposes and, and guides you know, the kinds of contradictions and the translation of those. So I'm thinking that has been an essential issue of how these mediating agencies, right, seemingly at a time when we have a progressive administration, how can these nonprofits become the facilitators of a new type of relationship between policy and a kind of uh, urban imagination as embedded in these neighborhoods. Uh, the mediating of top down and bottom up. I'm saying this because you know, a lot of people think that I I'm just interested in the small uh, or the kind of uh, bottom up on its own terms, which uh, it would be crazy because we would just be perpetuating the pendulum. I think more and more what we need is practices that are critically engaging that gap uh, and mediate new possibilities between the top down and the bottom up. Uh, designing collaboration, uh, this is, has been the primary aspect of the practice in translating the informal, in, in exchanging knowledge with these uh, activist practices so that we can provide new systems of visualization to together again uh, enable that political and social knowledge. So the notion that the neighborhood could be a political unit in this case to produce its own policy and economy of housing has been the project in the last years. And more and more, I was, uh, it was clear that what we also needed to engage is the designing of social contracts, the designing of agreements of protocols that could enable these possibilities. So one primary aspect of the project had to do with the designing of a micro-policy with this nonprofit organization in the last years. It's taken us 10 years to change zoning in this particular neighborhood. And finally, now in June, we are pulling permits of construction for this very small housing project. But it began uh, with nothing, again. And how do we, as architects, uh, not wait for clients? We actually construct them and construct the, 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 the devices, let's say, to produce that transformation. So the San Isidro uh, micro policy beginning again with the amplification of the role of the nonprofit in translating and mediating the invisibility of this uh, activity. See, I'm thinking again, we need to challenge our notions of representation. What these agencies do, they are the political representation of what is invisible, uh, bundling and reorganizing that potential into new models. So we propose to the municipality a, a, a micro policy that would begin by the mapping of encroachment meaning the mapping of all the illegal additions 
and businesses that were plugged into this fabric of this small neighborhood to be legitimized uh, by the municipality. And I know some of you might be thinking, well, what, what is the danger in legitimizing the invisible? Uh, that would be maybe a good conversation with the tequila afterwards. But uh, the point of the matter is that at that point, we also needed to engage new types of interfaces with the community because we've been so patronizing as architects. You know, even though people think that I am a community-based designer, I cannot be more critical of the kind of reductive, the kind of the cliches that have emerged from that type of uh, process. Uh, architects coming to communities to ask what the community wants and then just retreating to designing, coming back just to present. I mean, sometimes was a revelation. Communities might not know what they want. Equally, we are ignorant of the very nature of those uh, you know, uh, transactions embedded in that community. So the critical debate, how do we basically produce interface mechanisms to amplify the question, to, to, you know, to uh, produce, produce a more critical conversation was essential. And th there is no time right now to uh, tell the story. Yesterday, I think in the interview, I, I tried to do that and how some of these community workshops that have sought to dismantle some of these cliches into, uh, by designing games and uh, artifacts and visualizations uh, to enable other ways of conceptualizing this transaction. I mentioned that the first thing that this community wanted 10 years ago when we did the first workshop was a Costco wrapped with Aztec pyramids. And easily, I, you know, it, it was obvious that uh, many of these communities, all of us, are still uh, depending on the discourse that is pretty much guided by style by the packaging of identity, as I've called it, and that we needed to begin displacing the conversation from style into all those other invisible kind of transactions. So these games and artifacts began to suggest uh, to the community in our conversation that the negotiation with private and, uh, and public boundaries, the illegal additions, all of that uh, a set of operations, again, the praxis of the informal was as, as powerful as an instrument to rethink urbanization for this neighborhood. Uh, the notions that emerge from these conversations are fundamental uh, in, in rethinking these meanings. Uh, again, the construction of a new political language. Uh, so the municipality uh, authorizing those extra units, uh, we called it uh, common sense urbanization. And of course, the bringing together of many of these property owners who are, in a sense, illegal as co-developers uh, of a new model uh, of uh, more pixelated distributed sets of resources. This is an important thing because also we've been patronizing and just symbolically representing the community, but never making them co-producers. Uh, and co-organizers and co-managers of those resources. So that's what I mean about the social uh, contractual dimension that these nonprofits uh, construct. So the possibility of returning to our conversation, the, 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 the potential of a small scale development, because now uh, tax credits, as you know it, and many other mechanisms do not benefit small scale development. So uh, how does a community deal with a 50 unit based tax credit financing when in reality he does not want to build a 50 unit a large building, but in fact wants to break apart those 50 units and distribute them uh, through the neighborhood uh, to legitimize those small additions that are now uh, legal. So the nonprofit becomes a facilitator and the representative of the breaking apart of that large uh, pre uh, by prepackaging this financing uh, and by bundling, let's say, this social, uh, I hope I'm not confusing you, this is the part that is extremely complex to explain, but it has been, a, again, a way of reorganizing existing protocols. I'm, I'm interested not in uh, eliminating capitalism, I'm interested in, in the kind of reorientation and reorganization of those modes of production and, and surplus, I think, into benefiting uh, communities. So I think we need to negotiate with those existing uh, mechanisms uh, I'm not interested, as I was mentioning uh, to a group of friends of mine, to construct yet another commune where we will compose to death, but we will in fact be just another island in an enclave, in an, in an archipelago of enclaves. Uh, so the transformation again across this negotiation, across institutions and agencies where architects can in fact serve as interlocutors. Uh, of course, the political has a special consequences, as Francisco was saying, and as an architect, of course, committed to the possibility of translation into spatial logics, uh, I've been trying to work uh, in these small parcels in these neighborhoods to produce equal to the, um, uh, to the Buddhist temple, small uh, micro socioeconomic systems that can be supported by small infrastructural devices. So this is what I call the performance of a small parcel in San Isidro. 
uh, because again, parcels perform, just like that Buddhist temple. And uh, in this sort of animation, which was the only way to explain, as we were invited to the Museum of Modern Art to display this, how uh, there is a process behind that small parcels uh, of designing parcels as a small infrastructures to mobilize not only that entrepreneurship, uh, by the kind of cultural uh, production and political participation. The non-profits that 25 years ago were just simply service, social service providers, now they are becoming developers, alternative developers of housing. They purchase this church uh, and later uh, other parcels adjacent to it. This is one of the, the projects that we've been engaging in the last years. The idea that the church is retrofitted into a cultural incubator. I'm interested in the incubating of neighborhoods through smart programming as artists, architects, and non-profits can really conceptualize really interesting categories of program. Uh, these open air rooms, which we call social rooms, adjacent to collective kitchens as small infrastructures to support, in fact, that entrepreneurship. So how Casa Familiar injects, injects into these spaces, again, specific socioeconomic uh, programming and the kind of curating of the interface between space, people and programs. So at times, these become the site for the community workshops that they do monthly in this urban pedagogical model. Or maybe they frame some of those uh, informal markets that move from alleys to parcels to other streets. So in other words, how we pixelate also the public realm into these small private parcels. Uh, uh, this uh, now becomes, we can argue, and I'm saying this about the void because this is not just void for more house uh, that will grow through time, but in fact the void is the site available for uh, enabling this uh, informal socioeconomic, again, organizational processes. Uh, obviously, housing is not sustainable as units only. It needs to be plugged with economic and cultural support systems. And I can argue that this church as an incubator and the social rooms and the gardens and the kitchens are the micro infrastructure to now be threaded with housing uh, in a variety of economic performance. So this one deals with young couples and single mothers with, with children. The guarantees here is that the residents become co-producers of the programming that is injected in those environments. So again, this, uh, who is going to manage these environments? I was telling the students yesterday, well, they teach us to design beautiful spaces. They never teach us to know who is going to manage uh, those spaces, who is going to uh, uh, anticipate uh, the transformation and the uh, use accessibility of those spaces. The second typology is a duplex for uh, uh, artists who are working with social practices, who are really willing ultimately to choreograph pedagogical models of interface with the community. So they exchange uh, against uh, social service for rent. Uh, and of course, this is all built into the pro forma. Uh, and so I'm saying this because there is an incredible movement at this moment to rethink the relationship of art to community uh, and so on. Uh, and artists and dwellers or residents as co-producers of some of these programs. At the other end of the parcel, this is our small slivers, uh, uh, the larger units uh, with large kitchens, these are for families who live with grandmothers, uh, who also come contractually to the project with the nonprofit to a uh, partner in enabling uh, small businesses. Uh, many of these people cook in their homes and really are enabling very interesting projects. Uh, and finally, the, the last typology is a small accessory uh, unit uh, pieces. Uh, we found out, of course, in the code in San Diego that if a building is no larger than 12 uh, by 10, 120 square feet, does not need a permit. So if we put a utility sink, a large window, give it a 15 foot ceiling height in order not to trigger a ghost floor, it could be built by the community. So this stripe is all about uh, enabling the sweat equity to produce uh, sheds for extended families or flexible uses. So in the end, again, the idea that in a small parcel we have the coexistence of different housing economies and performance, but also mediated and curated by the nonprofit organization that choreographs a variety of programmatic contingencies that hopefully are very smart to enable different modes of socialization and economy. Uh, this is, uh, might be obvious to many of you, but this is what is absent from the logics of development out there, who have homogenized housing into one recipe. 
uh, and so on. So how to plug housing with support systems uh, for each of these spaces, I can argue there is a so social contract, a kind of organizational logic that uh, secures a little bit of uh, the, the kind of activation and the management and the sustainability of this. And of course, this is not about, uh, how to say it, a kind of happy story. I mean, out of these negotiations, there is always conflict. And I think that is a particular part of the issue, is how do you make a space available for uh, rethinking the encounter? Uh, Obviously, this has to do with challenging not only density, but the very definition of zoning that has been perpetuated as a punitive tool that prevents socialization. And instead, the effort of this activation of small parcels in thinking or neighborhoods, thinking of zoning as a generative tool that reorganizes a lending uh, and a, a also activity itself. Uh, so these small pieces, again, are uh, choreographed, are really curated in terms of their uh, 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 programming. This is the relationship, again, I was mentioning of programming spaces and people threaded uh, by a variety of spaces of inhabitation. You know, recently, uh, because in California we lost the uh, redevelopment monies in neighborhoods, I was explaining to Mark yesterday, I was happy to realize that our system of small pieces was agile enough uh, to enable other types of uh, funding to, pro to, to, uh, to not depend on that uh, lost money, let's say, but that uh, one stripe is uh, produced by the community in terms of building it uh, itself. Uh, the larger units that, uh, have a particular type of funding. Uh, the social rooms are being supported by a foundation. So in other words, this pixelation also, not only of pieces, but of uh, funding streams is uh, something that has been essential here. The democratization of urban development uh, is essential in terms of uh, the uh, alternative uh, modes of performa. And finally, uh, uh, because I've been rushing through this, but I, as usual, I couldn't edit. And uh, let me finish then uh, with a couple of gestures uh, that uh, emerge from this work, as I also have been working in, uh, as an artist in projects that really intervene into public debate and public space. Uh, but it's essential to suggest that I'm not only interested in the micro, per se, as I mentioned, but has been an excuse to begin rethinking the macro. And I think this scaling up is really ultimately the challenge. Uh, can we go from the border neighborhood, in fact, uh, to the rethinking of the border region? This has been the question for many of us working in San Diego, Tijuana. These are the two neighborhoods uh, from which I've been harvesting all the images I showed you today. Um, San Isidro and Laureles Canyon. This is an 85,000 people slum crashing against the border. This is the checkpoint, and that's San Isidro on the US side, very close to each other. Uh, and in, in a sense, have become incredible laboratories to rethink what potentially could be a way of reimagining the region. Could it be that it's about an urbanism of neighborhoods in a very specific kind of bundling of different modes of governance that are threaded and negotiated. Uh, and this is where the political equator emerges as a notion. Can, in fact, these micro, again, communities be a way of rethinking the very nature of the nation state? Can they become the laboratories to rethink policy? And this is the discovery I had uh, you know, a few years ago when I realized that Tijuana San Diego uh, is in a corridor of uh, global conflict between the 28th and 33 degrees north parallel, linking itself with some of the most contested, dramatic, critical border checkpoints in the world. Ceuta and Melilla, which is the main funnel of migration from Africa into Europe, even the Israel-Palestinian border, and so on. And in my imagination also, even the transformation of the Chinese metropolis out of uh, equally urbanities of labor and surveillance and control. And so this began to suggest a kind of correspondence, again, between local conditions and global. And this is what I wanted to amplify, that equal to the border flows, I began to notice out of the redefinition of the world's cartography by the Pentagon's new map after 9-11, that the Pentagon divided the world between the non-integrating gap, which is that red, and these functional families of the global south, where much of the mig uh, migration flows in the last years have really displaced themselves, seeking the strong economies of the functioning core. And in the opposite direction, the healthy, powerful economies of the functioning core have in the last also years 
this, this center, their uh, places of production, seeking uh, the cheap labor markets of the uh, non-integrating gap. Once more, people going in one direction, goods and services on the other, and this became a very emblematic also horizon. I wanted to, of course, uh, I began with the local horizon of conflict, ending with the global horizon uh, of conflict uh, as a way of uh, uh, echoing this situation. Later, I realized, and of course, recently we know that the Spring Revolution is in the ages of this uh, political equator, but I began to remember uh, the words of Buckminster Fuller when I juxtaposed the climatic equator uh, in the context of the red, the green and the red coming together, uh, is that he said at some point, no conversation could begin uh, in the rethinking of institutions uh, without understanding the future conflicts that will redefine the terms. The conflict between geopolitical boundaries, marginal communities, and natural resources, which I think is at stake at this very moment. So the possibility, again, of producing new correspondences between global and local, between top-down and bottom-up, between formal and informal, and ultimately, of course, between jurisdictional and the natural. The rethinking of property uh, resonated. Uh, so at some point, then I began to engage the environmental dimension unavoidably. And I realized that we in San Diego and these two neighborhoods, these two small neighborhoods, were at the tip end of the Tijuana River watershed system, which in fact is, as you know, the kind of uh, long of this region, I mean, in any region. Uh, and I began to realize how sadly it was that this watershed system was truncated by the border wall, by the wall itself. In fact, these two countries do not manage those resources together. 75% of that uh, watershed system is in Mexico, the rest in San Diego. And when we begin to zoom, we realize that at the very tip end, where the river enters into San Diego uh, and in fact collides with the wall, I, I forgot to mention that the checkpoint is exactly at the intersection of the natural and the political. Uh, but the two neighborhoods that I've been working with are flanking that uh, environmental zone called the Tijuana River Estuary which in turn is overlaid with militarization, with homeland security. So uh, the project recently has been how to link these two neighborhoods and two communities, which uh, can be amplified as laboratories to rethink much of what I've been talking about today, housing paradigms, infrastructural systems, and environmentalism. So I began to curate a series of events, which is what Francisco mentioned today as he came to this one. And I proposed to homeland security and Mexican immigration in collaboration with an activist, Oscar Romo, who works with the estuary and with this community, to transform a drain uh, that has been built recently by Homeland Security. After 9-11, uh, this uh, corridor, uh, 150 feet wide, was claimed by Homeland Security, and they began to demolish in every canyon of that watershed system that is transversal to the, to, to the wall, damming it with earth. Uh, so we began to uh, produce an alternative way of crossing. We convinced Homeland Security to let us put a tent inside their territory to produce a conversation across activists, um, uh, architects, uh, scholars, and communities uh, at this very juncture between the slum and the estuary in the distance. This is the wall itself. At the juncture between the barrio and the estuary, I've been interested in bringing the public itself to the sites of conflict uh, to reorganize the conversation. We call it the political equator three uh, at this very juncture. Look at this. This is the Laureles Canyon, and this is the trash that after Homeland Security has been building these new walls has accelerated the flow of sediment from the, from the slum into the estuary, beginning to contaminate it. So isn't that strange that the trash that is imported to, San, to Tijuana now is exiting back into San Diego? And so these are strange loops, uh, we began to uh, recognize the need to amplify it. And so uh, models, visualizations are important as we bring the public to debate these issues. I've been very interested in this notion uh, of bringing the different stakeholders. This is a new dam. Look at that. Behind that wall is a canyon, the 85,000 people settlement. So we were arguing, let's bring this to awareness of the institutions, that while the stupid institutions are building these artifacts for the sake of security, we can argue that in fact they are building in security because they are undermining, in fact, the functionality of that watershed system that eventually can produce socioeconomic degradation and instability. So this kind of reversal of the terms, and we um, basically, after that uh, presentation of the model, 
uh, we began the, 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 the traversing of the territory uh, as, the, as the audience who came to this event uh, was granted permission. We needed to have passports. We wanted to actually make it into an office, official passage, transforming uh, the uh, drain into an official port of entry from San Diego into Mexico. Uh, I've been, as I mentioned to the students yesterday, very much enamored with Chantal Mouffe, political philosopher, position uh, in the idea of agonism. It's different to antagonism. The idea that democracy depends on levels of dissensus. That democracy has been atrophied by too much consensus, she says. So that uh, public space, in her words, is really a battleground uh, where the, the, the power of institution, institutional power, economically, politically, is visualized. So the visualization of these sites of collision uh, are an essential a point of departure to the reframing of the conversation. So uh, this really inspired this, and here we are, we, I mean, convincing this. Uh, uh, that uh, brought us to a, an invitation in Korea, in South Korea, to come and intervene in the city of Anyang, uh, uh, which as you can imagine is emblematic of many Chinese cities in the explosion uh, of not only urbanization, but very strange housing models. Uh, and we call this project Conversations on Coexistence. I came to the city of Anyang, and here I am in the 23rd floor uh, of the municipality, talking to Kion Park, who was the curator of the event, and the mayor, as he met with all the artists. And in the distance, I see many of those houses on the hill that reminded me of the kind of bucolic landscape of Southern California. But when I got close to the window, I realized that these were just the tip ends of what was a huge homogeneous uh, housing uh, slabs. Again, uh, once more, while I come from California, which is the pancake, how to call it, the, the kind of uh, horizontal sprawl, here we have a kind of vertical sprawl. And here, once more, we are unable to negotiate the conflict between the vertical and the horizontal. So I began to realize that the project I wanted to propose for this project was to engage, in fact, that conflict. Uh, and we proposed to make models uh, of the five neighborhoods that were slated for demolition in the next five years uh, in Anyang. Uh, I was uh, very much inspired by a visit I made to the uh, City Museum in Paris where somebody had the idea in the late uh, 19th century to make models of the neighborhoods that Hausmann demolished. And they were the only evidence of memory of these environments. So we said, why not to in fact make these models? Let's make them really faithful, really kind of how to call it lyrical again. So I unfortunately did not engage the students of architecture because I didn't want these sort of bass wood models, these abstractions. I wanted something a lot more anal uh, in a sense of like the details, the details of, of the, uh, every uh, day life. Uh, so, but the idea that these models would become the mediating tools to reorganize a conversation. Uh, so we engage uh, school children in elementary schools, engineering students in the university, and the activists themselves in some of these neighborhoods. Uh, and we began to mobilize through eight months the models as we were building them uh, to a series of conversations that would begin to amplify the hidden value of these neighborhoods. How, again, these neighborhoods perform across social and economic uh, conditions that were being ignored when they were actually transforming to the new uh, towers. In other words, we did not want to nostalgically preserve these neighborhoods. We said, unavoidably, we need to grow. But please, let's grow intelligently. And in that case, it was about how to understand the capacity, the value of these transactions with space that could be transforming uh, the new projects. Uh, so this one, which was one of the neighborhoods most beautiful, is called the Seoksu Market. Uh, the, sometimes the model served uh, to produce mini kind of uh, animations to kind of get people talking, uh, because literally that's what uh, ultimately would occur in this sort of a strange transaction from one environment to another. And as we were moving this, we also uh, we were also documenting uh, through video an amazing array of amazing projects, uh, again, of informal praxis, as this man who had a snail farm in four rooftops in this neighborhood, but also had uh, produced a very interesting coalition with his neighbors 
to produce a cooperative. Again, some of these environments are so much alive with urban agriculture and people really taking advantage of these spaces. Uh, the kind of associative fabric of these communities was an asset and yet was ignored. And of course, not only for the sake of producing quirky spaces, but it's really essential the absorption of this activity into uh, the formation of new policy or economy. In other words, this is essential to the sustainability of those neighborhoods. The other one was this amazing case of a man who had built, uh, and, and there are so many, I, I just show these two, they had built a small playground squeezed between a leftover space, an alley, some dilapidated houses, and an uh, urban agricultural kind of uh, community garden. Uh, but again, this sort of compensation for the lack of public you know, amenities and, and again, these uh, people constructing their own devices. Um, so I think that this translation of these uh, activities uh, into a, a kind of discourse, because we were uh, surprised that even the activists did not have the language to talk about the value of those environments in, the, in their own reaction for uh, pushing the institutions uh, away uh, in a kind of reactionary way. And so we thought that it was important to bring this conversation not only to the activists, but to the designers themselves of the towers, uh, to the administration, the mayor office, uh, and the developers, even the Catholic Church, uh, because that becomes the epicenter of the resistance in Korea. And, and through those, that virtual conversation, the generation of a new political language. I'm interested in that possibility uh, that could enable us, again, as designers, to intervene in the debate itself. Across, across these divided constituencies. So at the end, uh, the project uh, 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 resulted in a kind of bill of rights uh, of the neighborhood, inspired very much on FDR, so students please read that document because it's powerful. At the end, the, the, the activists concluded on this, almost the same premises embedded in that document. The right of neighborhoods to enable the coexistence of different economies of housing, uh, the right to develop incrementally at different speeds of growth, the right of neighborhoods to share the profits of urbanization, enabling local modes of production. The right to retrofit themselves, enabling small and inclusive development. So once more, alive very much here was the operative dimension of participation. Obviously, what they were talking about is what Okwi Ewensor told me recently, I mentioned to the students yesterday. The need to move from the neutrality of our ideas of the public to levels of specificity. Because again, as Okwi reminded me, he said the most powerful image of the civil rights was uh, the moment when that woman so, uh, sat where she did not belong. You can argue that the bus was public, but it was not accessible to everyone. So he said, let's move from the neutrality of the public to the specificity of rights. And the question for me is, can rights be designed? Can we be the designers and the conceptualizers of new types of protocols? Can at this moment the future of the city, in fact, be determined less by buildings as much as we want to, but more about the reorganization of socioeconomic relations? And do we as architects have a role in doing that? Can we rethink the very nature of utopia? And let me end with this. Something that I was mentioning yesterday uh, that uh, Slavoj Žižek uh, mentioned in a wonderful speech in Argentina not too long ago. Uh, I began with a, a statement by uh, um, General Petreus. Let me finish with two inspirational quotes, one by my friend Tania Bruguera, who is a performance artist, who in Bogota recently in, in a, a Hemispheric Institute on Politics and Performance Convention, uh, she mentioned to me, Teddy, this is the time, she said, to restore Duchamp's urinal back to the bathroom. And, and I don't want to get into the explanation of this, but because it's about a two-way journey. If, if we could do to the institutions what Duchamp did through his work, we would be talking. But also, if we can rethink the power of the everyday, as uh, suggested in that two-way journey, top down, bottom up, then again, we would be talking more substantially today. Uh, but also by Shishek, uh, who suggested that we need to reimagine utopia. Less this idealized future uh, that might not arrive too soon, that we will not experience, or less having to do with the capitalist utopia, he said, of the production of these perverse landscapes that very few of us have access to. He said, let's reimagine it as a more modest utopia. He's the one, I think, who changed the words of, uh, uh, of this slogan, who said, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine modest 
alterations of capitalism. And I'm interested, in fact, in that kind of modesty of the uh, types of transformations that really only come from a sense of urgency at very small but hopefully self-assured levels that can begin to accumulate uh, into something more powerful. The seeking of a new civic imagination is at stake in our time. And uh, of course, the linking of urban policy and public participation. Last slide I want to show because I could not avoid today as we travel through uh, Syracuse and I'm thinking here there is something fundamentally incredible happening. I don't want to sound awfully patronizing or something, but I detect as I was trying to piece together the complexity of negotiations that occur between universities and cities and communities. There is something here, uh, either guided, of course, by certain cultural pimps or other types of agencies. Uh, when we uh, visited uh, today uh, 601 uh, uh, Tully, uh, and when we were moving across uh, uh, agencies near West Side Initiative, Home Headquarters, Syracuse University, uh, the new uh, WCNY uh, 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 building its programming, uh, the possibility of no, no James uh, grocery store to negotiate its own uh, type of presence in relationship to health and well-being with these other agencies, etc. Uh, if, if all these efforts that really uh, enable a kind of transaction across institutions, and I was today at this place and uh, as we were uh, taken by Marion Wilson and I go to the bathroom and I see above the mirror a little diagram uh, that, that she had there and I asked what is that well she said this is an effort to visualize what has happened or how we were able maybe to do this and it's obviously the complexity of these multiple transactions across agencies, institutions, resources that need to be curated, but need to be visualized. Because what I want to take from here is not the wonderful buildings that have been produced, which are essential in terms of our pursuit for beauty, but it is in fact this negotiation, which is for me the very essence of the construction of the political. I don't want to talk about political architecture, I want to talk about the construction of the political, and I think we are architects have a role in doing that. Sorry for taking so long. Thank you very much. Could you take a couple questions? Yes, a couple. Yes, yeah, sorry. This was like the long version, but I knew that I could take advantage of your masochism. <laughs> <laughs> Questions about the We can go downstairs and maybe talk downstairs. Yes, let's do it. Thank you.